Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Vision Zero Cities Spring Pop-Up. This first panel in our two-day conference will focus on how to design slower streets. This topic is increasingly crucial as many cities have seen a rise in speeding and a correlated increase in traffic violence. The speed of cars traveling is a contributing factor to crashes, injuries, and fatalities, and even modest reductions in average speeds can lead to huge improvements in safety and quite literally save lives. The good news is we have solutions and they not only improve, improve the safety of all road users, but are better for our communities, our health, the environment, and our quality of life. We are incredibly fortunate to have a panel of experts here to dive into the details of how we can build safety into our streets. So allow me to introduce our panelists. We are joined by Rosanna Tudeau, Senior Project Manager at 880 Cities, Megan Weir, Safe Streets Division Manager for the City of Oakland's Department of Transportation, and Allison Fletcher, Senior Associate at Nelson Newgard. Before we launch into the presentations, which will be followed by a discussion and a chance to ask the panelists your questions, allow me to introduce myself. My name is M. Friedenberg, and I'll be moderating this discussion on designing for lower speed. I've spent most of my life biking around Portland, Oregon, but also lived and worked in Copenhagen, Denmark, prior to moving to New York City in 2019 to join transportation alternatives. I've been lucky enough to be involved with many of TA's pandemic response campaigns and initiatives, including NYC 25 by 25, our newest report and coalition of more than 100 members. Just out this week, 25 by 25 is a challenge to New York City's next leaders to address the inequitable distribution of public space and the ongoing harm to, of car traffic to New Yorkers' health and safety in the New York City economy. So thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time to share their expertise with us today. We'll start with a presentation from Allison Fletcher coming to us from Nelson Nygaard. Nelson Nygaard is a transportation planning firm committed to developing systems that promote vibrant, sustainable, and accessible communities. Allison has developed plans for downtown multimodal networks and urban trails across the United States and has an interdisciplinary background in architecture planning and landscape architecture. So feel free to add your questions in the Zoom chat here and we'll turn to Allison to get us started. Thanks, Em. I'm gonna pull my slides up here. So thanks everyone for joining today and thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna be uh, the first to speak today to kind of talk through the geometric toolbox of uh, things that are in various design guides that talk about the tools for getting people to travel slower and safer on streets. Um, some of the things that we're gonna walk through in the slides that I have today are some of the network drivers that contribute to more driving and um, greater VMT in the first place, uh, looking at things such as one ways and two way streets, the number of lanes, the lane width and the geometry of that, and also the, the corners and the turn radii, and some of the adjacent land use factors, including treatments on the streetscape and how those relate to speeding. And I'll talk a little bit more about all of these in detail through a couple of case studies. So one of the first things I want to talk about that's a core um, practice of Nelson Nygaard and also research that we like to build on and apply through our work is just about the fact that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> Factor of having parking in the first place. Um, one of the books and resources that we focus on pretty often is the high cost of free parking and the implications of the cost of land and other things through parking itself. And also recently, there's been more research verifying that having more parking puts more cars on the road in the first place. So if there's, um, you know, whenever you're thinking about on-street parking or especially off-street parking, you know, the impact that that has on enticing more trips to happen based on the convenience that that provides, especially if it's provided as free. Um, another thing I just wanna keep a lens on is also just how we move people in the streets. Um, the same space that's used to drive 100 people in cars alone could move even more people through different means and having more of a mix of activity users and also keeping an eye to the cost of delivering those services and also what other services could be provided um, if we imagine different ways of moving people in the streets. Uh, another thing that I think uh, contributes from a network perspective is just how the streets are laid out in the first place. Some of us might be calling in from cities that look like the streets grid on the left, like something like New York or many other cities where you have a very predictable grid with small blocks um, and lots of linkages that enable more easy and more facilitated walking and biking through a neighborhood, whereas other types of grid layouts in cities can contribute to the inconvenience of walking and biking unless there's special accommodations that are put in place. And so the network grid also contributes to the presence and the enticement of whether driving is your most convenient um, or takes the least amount of time in the way that you're getting through. 
a neighborhood. I think another thing to think about when planning for cities or potentially for new neighborhoods or retrofitting streets is also the number of intersections that are um, generated through the layout and design of those streets. Um, there's, you know, a different number of intersections and different types of layouts. This is just a hypothetical scenario, um, but having more predictable intersections with more predictable geometry, of course, can often be safer and can also be more familiar in terms of the way that people are using the streets. So a lot of our work also involves retrofitting very strange <laughs> shaped intersections. And so something to, to keep in mind um, in the initial design of streets and networks. Uh, another thing that we do a lot of in our work is looking at one-way versus two-way street systems and the implications that that has not only on safety, but also on travel time, also on the convenience of using the network and whether driving is more attractive and also the inverse effects that it might have on safety in terms of contributing to speeding, increasing the number of left-hand turns that people are making, which introduces more of those more risky maneuvers at the intersections happening within a network and also potentially contributing to delay. Not all one ways are bad. Um, there's many, many cities that have really great one way systems. I think what matters is the geometry of the street and the number of lanes and how it's functioning as a network. And are people bypassing businesses? Do they have to turn back around? Is it confusing? Is it legible to the people that are using the system? Um, often having more one ways and not having a predictable layout of one ways can contribute to the, the network being very illegible or confusing and leads to more trips generated into a downtown area, which can have an inverse effect on having more, more speeding. Um, from a pedestrian safety perspective, it can be kind of counterintuitive that I think a lot of one ways are implemented across the country with the idea that it would be more convenient for people that are walking to only have to look one way as they cross the street. But this has also led to the factor of drivers thinking they only have to look one way and they might um, drive down a street, make a particular maneuver, and put somebody's life at risk in that scenario. So we're always trying to look at all the context factors when we're thinking about one-way to two-way conversion systems and doing analysis around that. Uh, speaking also of the street grid, um, one of the things we like to also analyze is the street hierarchy, you know, the different levels of streets that are servicing different needs. And if there are crash patterns, where are those crashes predominantly happening to inform where the needs are for retrofitting design solutions? You know, are they happening because of signals? Are they happening on more like larger, busier streets? Are they happening on smaller side streets? Sorry for the car horns. <laughs> um, and with all of this keeping in mind, you know, the severity of the speed that people are taking on different roadways and the relationship that I think many of us probably here already know that that has on the likelihood of surviving um, an incident that may happen on the streets. So getting to the number of lanes that are provided in the street, these are some base maps from two projects we've been doing in collaboration with Jeff Speck for downtowns that look very similar, although they're in very different places. The map on the left is from Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is the inner dispersal loop known as the IDL that contains the downtown area. There, you can see here that there's a number of one-way streets that are many, many lanes. And this is a map actually of just the number of lanes that are not needed to service the network. Each of these streets is about four to five lanes in the whole downtown area. And so we did a systematic analysis to look at one-way conversions to two-way in this area, and also found a lot of lanes that weren't needed to serve the number of travel trips that are in the downtown area. And all of these were also contributing to a lot of safety issues in the downtown. The map on the right is from a current project we're doing in Mobile, Alabama in the downtown. And each of the lines represents the number of lanes that are there. And those that are in red are those that we found in our analysis are not needed to service the network today. So this is a foundational tool that we often use to define the need of the downtown streets and assessing opportunities for converting to other uses or redefining the geometry in a way that would contribute to less speeding in the downtown area. One of the ways we often deploy this is through road diets, also known as road buffets or other terminology that different geographies come up with. There's many benefits to doing these. Um, and this table on the right is a, um, an assessment that we did of some before and after road diets in many cities across the country, showing that the, the number of trips was the same. There's often a fear if you take out the lane that there's gonna be, um, you know, that it's not gonna be able to carry the same traffic even though it has a less lane in the, the cross section of the street. Um, and this found that there was actually no significant increases in traffic or delays given the, the, um, the removal of the lanes. 
When I'm speaking of a road diet, this is a classical four to three lane road diet. It's a diagram discussing what's often going on in the geometric scenarios of these. Probably many of us have experienced what it's like to be on some of these four lane roadways. It's kind of stressful. Um, there's two lanes going in each direction and the middle lane becomes very um, problematic in terms of predicting is somebody in front of you gonna turn left or not? And am I gonna wait for them? And am I gonna make a risky maneuver around those people in the street? And then also the people, the way that they're set up geometrically in the, the roadway, they're kind of blocking the sight lines of what's happening from one side of the street to the next. And there's kind of this guessing game and a lot of risking that happens in the left turn lanes. And there's these cars that are coming up in the approaches that are not visible by those that are turning left, which le leads to T-bone collisions. And then we're not even talking about the bike and pedestrian <laughs> safety implications of all of this as well. But in a revised solution, we've, we know that um, cars, um, roadways that carry less than 24,000 vehicles a day have the potential for conversion and carrying the same amount of traffic in a three lane configuration, which leads to a geometric outcome where there is more visibility between the different cars using the street and can potentially free up space to have you know, a tighter curb to curb distance and having room for more like walking and biking facilities in the cross section. Another thing we're often thinking about from the geometric perspective is just what vehicle we're designing for. You know, this is a range of those that are included in the NACTO design guide. We often use auto turn to test how these, these vehicles are maneuvering through the roadway, but we also need to think about other design vehicles that could be used like e-cargo bikes, um, mail bikes, et cetera. Um, another thing contributing to dangers in the street is the actual width of the lane itself. Um, this is a study looking at the relationship between um, the lane width and speeding. As you can see, the wider the lane is, especially getting over 12 feet wide, the more speeding that incidence of speeding that happens on the street itself. So NACDO actually recommends using 10 or 11 feet in many instances, sometimes 11 or 12 are needed when there's opposing bus traffic, but there's lots of cities that are using 10 and nine on streets that even carry transit service. And so there's a lot of discussion about what the right lane width is in a given area. Um, we also know the number of lanes is an issue at intersections in particular for pedestrian and bicycle collision and the likelihood of them happening. This is a graph from our project for uh, Santa Ana Safe Mobility and looking at the number of collisions um, here and the type of um, number of lanes in that as well. Another geometric factor is the turn radii itself. Um, NACTO recommends a 15 foot as a happy medium for many urban streets in terms of controlling the speed at which a car is taking a corner. And there's one thing that's the actual corner itself, but also the effective radii of how it's making that turn itself. Uh, there's lots of also new design interventions like mountable truck aprons and lots of other things that are happening on streets where if this is not possible and there needs to be some trade-offs, there's multiple ways of executing something like this that can help make intersections safer through the corner radii that's deployed in the design. An important um, design factor, especially on neighborhood streets, is using horizontal deflection. This is a picture of a form of chicane where you're using things in the roadway to get the, the vehicle to travel out of the linear path that it's often traveling down the street. This one's also using a median island to um, reinforce that physically in the way that's done. These are pictures from Somerville, Massachusetts, where I actually live, um, of neighbor ways. There's a great team here that's deploying things on the street. Many of these are pictures from during COVID solutions that they've been putting in the streets. This one is Morrison Ave. This is one that's a parkway somewhere else. And then there's a number of streets that have these signs that it's for local access, but accepting walking and biking. The one on Morrison is very interesting because there's a sign that it's a one lane roadway. So it's ostensibly a yield street. So cars would have to wait before they pass each other as they go through. But there's of course through bollards, a cut through for people that are biking down the street to still be able to use it. Um, these are very quick and easy to prepare. There's a fleet of team that goes out and fixes these bollards as needed. Um, try to get through these quickly. But um, another thing to consider is just what's happening along the edge of the curb. This is a picture of Broadway, a street in Wichita and downtown where we've been working. And this is a street that aspires through the zoning and the long-term plan to have more retail and mixed use along it. Um, but as you can see, this is a, a road in need of a diet. <laughs> There's not very many cars um, carried on this road. And then um, the lack of parking contributes to speeding. Whereas in comparison, this is Douglas Street near one of their pop-up parks. 
you can just see through here that the, also the other role in terms of safety that on-street parking can provide is providing that physical barrier between the moving track and also where people are on the sidewalk in terms of how the overall street is used and what the sense of comfort is. Sometimes we're trying to use up excess pavement and everything that I'm kind of talking about is just like ways to utilize the pavement more efficiently and to also contribute to less speeding. Um, sometimes we deploy this through on-street parking that's put in an angled fashion because that takes up more width in the cross-section of the street. Ideally, though, that that is used in a back-end angled parking fashion. Um, this is not necessarily politically salient in all geographies, but this is much easier if somebody is also walking or biking in the corridor, that people see where they're going as they're backing or coming back out of the spaces into the roadway. Um, there's also many studies that show that on the presence of street trees contributes to slower traffic, as does on-street parking. Um, also, there's study, studies that prove that on-street trees also contribute to less road rage, <laughs> which might contribute to less speeding as well, and more um, happy collaborations between people that are sharing the street. Um, we've been experimenting and design. These are pictures from abroad, um, but you know, how can the street trees also go into the same space that on-street parking is? When you have more limited right-of-way, you need to come up with very um, unique design solutions, and I'm kind of curious to research further also, you know, the closer that the street trees are into the street, how that affects speeding or not, and if it has an impact. Um, so I'm gonna just skip through some of these, but you know, these are some of the typical safety concerns and solutions to different um, biking and pedestrian things that come up in the street. But I know we need to move on to some other speakers. So I was gonna skip ahead to just talk about another exercise where we're putting all of this in play into a crazy intersection <laughs> in Mobile, Alabama. This is in the northeast corner of the downtown. And this is a street that actually services one of the biggest trucking areas um, in North America where a lot of shipments come in to the port east of here. Um, but at the same time, this is also where the downtown transit center is located. And there's a neighborhood over here where kids are also trying to get to the convenience store to go and get snacks. And so we've been looking at geometric possibilities with you know, allowing the truck service that needs to continue happening in this area to also redefine that in terms of the turn radii, finding opportunities for people to have refuges in the intersection, getting better marked crosswalks and shorter crossing distances overall. So we're using auto turn and some of the tools that we've been discussing here today to assess two different alternatives for how this intersection could be improved for the walking and biking connectivity that is needed at that intersection. So happy to discuss more of these things as we get into the Q&A, but I thank you all for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much for that perspective, Allison. Next, we'll move to Megan Weir, who's the Safe Streets Division Manager for the City of Oakland's Department of Transportation, which received plaudits earlier this year for its impressive Slow Streets program in response to the pandemic. Megan oversees the bike and pedestrian program, traffic engineering and maintenance, and signal operations teams. Prior to starting at Oak DOT in everyone's favorite month, March of 2020, Mark Megan was the director of the program on health, equity, and sustainability at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and also co-chaired San Francisco's Vision Zero Cities or Vision Zero Task Force. So, Megan, when you're ready. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here today, and um, thank you, Allison, for the impressive overview of of, uh, of best practice and and. And looking forward to just sharing some of our examples um, from Oakland. Um, and as I was preparing my presentation today, really realized that, you know, in addition to the really specific uh, roadway design that is needed to slow speeds, issues of how we prioritize, where we implement those improvements, and also engagement on those improvements are really critical. So that, um, you know, became a theme of my presentation. But, since this is a Vision Zero Cities, um, and you know, I, we of course can't overstate, um, you know, why are we focusing on slowing speeds in the first in the first place? And that's of course, um, you know, due to the association of slower speeds with survival in, in crashes, and particularly for people walking and biking, and also our you know, uh, fatality also increases risk of fatality increases also as, as we age. So just really wanting to start by grounding ourselves in this speed discussion. And of course, we're all um, you know, aware of the increases in speeds during COVID-19, as well as increases in, in traffic fatalities associated with those speeds. And you know, here in Oakland, as I'm sure in many other jurisdictions, we also, we're also seeing an increase um, in local speeds and, and in residents' awareness, uh, you know, of the speeding traffic. So increased demand for 
the types of improvements that we're talking about here today. But also uh, severe and fatal injuries really disproportionately impact our low-income communities, communities of color, as well as senior residents. So again, as we're thinking about speed treatments and how we prioritize them, um, acknowledging the, the increased risk of these populations in Oakland, um, black residents are twice as likely to be killed or severely injured in a crash and three times as likely while walking. Um, we see higher concentrations of our high injury network in uh, majority Asian census tracts and seniors are, are also more vulnerable. Many, uh, you know, many cities have high injury networks. Um, we again see really similar patterns across cities where for example, in Oakland, just 6% of the streets are where over 60% of our severe and fatal crashes occur. So when we're talking about prioritization and, and lowering speeds, um, high injury networks are a really helpful tool. Um, and again, with respect to equity, high injury networks are disproportionately concentrated in what in Oakland we refer to as our priority equity neighborhoods. So this is again, where we have higher concentrations of low-income communities, communities of color, seniors, and, and populations that are more dependent on walking and transit for transportation. On these high injury networks, um, you know, arterial treatments, and many of which Allison was talking about, um, but our high, high injury networks are also sadly, you know, highly predict where people are killed in crashes. So we recently um, completed improvements on 35th Avenue, one of Oakland's high injury network um, in, and in response to a number of tragedies, including the fatality of Deontay Bush while biking. Uh, the rapid response immediately following that fatality included a number of improvements, both to increase the visibility of pedestrians, but also to slow speeds, including uh, visually narrowing the lanes on that corridor and just last week, uh, speed, speed cushions were piloted on that street, which have uh, slots in the middle of the cushions to allow for, that were designed in collaboration with our lo local transit agency. Um, so we could allow, allow this type of treatment on a corridor, which typically would have, would have not had, had that type of a speed, a speed cushion. So working you know, with, our, with our partner agencies on what types of effective treatments we can we can install on our high injury corridors, and this is something that we'll be evaluating um, moving forward. Is there's a, of course a high level of interest. Another example of a, of a rapid response on a high injury corridor is at 98th and Cherry in Oakland. So on the left is the rapid response. So a paint paint and post um, median island and an improved. Uh, signage and, and painting, but what we've also learned, while temporary, like more rapid treatments are really popular um, and a way that, that the city can respond quickly um, following a, a tragedy, these same corridors really have a high level of wear on these types of treatments. So on the right, um, we recently um, were able to upgrade that, that median island to a concrete median island. And so I think a lesson learned as we're looking towards these types of improvements to more quickly adapt is also, you know, how can we develop a pipeline so that more permanent installations are, are anticipated and installed. Again, with respect to um, community driven requests related to traffic safety speed, again, is a, is a really common concern around Oakland. Um, our 311 service requests related to traffic safety. Historically, we've had around 8,000 a year, but in the past year, um, we're well on our way to exceeding 1,000 a, a um, service requests to respond to. And this is for a program within my team that really focuses on intersections and on traffic signs, pavement markings, and common traffic calming devices to support safer, safer speeds and also lower traffic volumes. And so similarly, with respect to prioritization, we prioritize uh, these requests based on both the crash history, with a focus on severe and fatal injuries, on equity, so prioritizing work in historically underserved or underprioritized neighborhoods, and also schools. 
We do have a residential speed hump program, which is uh, very popular and also, again, another treatment that we've seen an increased demand um, with in the, in the past year um, with demonstrated evidence regarding the effectiveness of speed bumps. It does require a resident petition um, and we work closely with other agencies to review the appropriateness of uh, specific locations. Here's some other examples of traffic calming treatments. Again, thank you, Allison, for the really comprehensive overview. Um, we, this slide includes a hardened center line up on the upper left, uh, of course, a, a speed bump, as well as traffic circles. And now to, to segue to our, our Slow Streets program and lessons learned from COVID-19, um, Oakland, launched our Slow Streets program. It's hard to believe it was last April. Um, so com coming up on a year. Um, and on the left is our, our Slow Street, an example of our Slow Streets corridors, which are our soft street closures to repurpose local streets to support, uh, you know, physically distance walking and biking during, during COVID. But also as we launched this program, we heard really clearly, particularly from communities with more essential workers, where more people were, you know, were still driving during during COVID and reporting to work, um, which were also communities with higher concentrations of of communities of color and low income residents, that slow streets weren't necessarily responsive to their needs during COVID-19, and so we also developed our slow streets essential places program which focused more on temporary traffic calming improvements at those essential places that people were traveling during COVID-19, like grocery stores, food distribution sites, and health facilities. And this was really focused on our high injury network um, and, and in our priority equity communities. I really can't overemphasize you know, the importance, I think, of engagement overall, but particularly uh, was really impressed with my colleagues' abilities to, uh, to adapt during COVID-19. And for Slow Streets and a number of our other projects included regular meetings with advocates and community stakeholders from priority neighborhoods, of course, via, via Zoom, um, but also interagency coordination um, with city agencies. We also worked uh, to get out the word through press conferences, but also developed online surveys that were translated into Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese and created public facing results dashboards to be transparent about what we were learning and what we were doing. Um, conducted intercept surveys to evaluate uh, slow streets and also uh, worked to develop uh, COVID safe walk shops and also really um, upping our game with respect to uh, residential mailers. Our program has really evolved a lot since, since it was initially launched in response to this ongoing engagement and, and feedback, including the development of our essential places program, but also in, in communities where, where Slow Streets was not um, perceived as like responsive to community needs during COVID, only launching corridors as a result of community partnerships. Also, we were really fortunate to get a Smart Growth America grant to work with an, a local artist to design improved barricades um, and also really work to use those temporary installations to communicate public health messaging and, and resources. So those of you who are um, love data and are, are interested in this topic, I just wanna point out our, our link to our Slow Streets website where we have a really detailed evaluation and, and uh, summarize our, our findings with respect to uh, two slow streets. And we're currently working to stabilize our program for the duration of the pandemic. Some key findings are that our slow streets were really able to create space for physically physical activity without impeding essential street functions and received a lot of positive, I think I'll wait an hour before restarting my computer, sorry. Um, it received a lot of positive support, um, but the support was really varied um, with the highest levels of support from higher income white and white residents and essential workers and DP Oakland residents sharing it wasn't meeting their needs. Um, we learned that we had a lot of work to do with respect to communication and that focusing on traffic safety was really important to, to residents that where slow streets was not responsive. And finally, that not a shock, but a really important lesson given the unpredictable duration of our pandemic was that cones and barricades were not sustainable materials. So since we launched Slow Streets um, on the 
left of this slide is our more durable barricades and new slow street signage that, that we've uh, started rolling out after engaging with corridors about whether or not they are interested in continuing the slow streets. This is signage um, that was informed by some of the art that was created for our Smart Growth America grant and barricades that are actually bolted into the ground. Um, and we're rolling this out on some of the corridors where we had higher traffic volumes and speeds that were leading to increased maintenance issues. But another lesson learned from our slow streets are really that slow streets were an, a really important conversation starter. So, you know, installing these temporary um, traffic, traffic calming um, treatments, it, it really is just the beginning of a discussion with every corridor. And for one corridor, Nay Avenue, we installed slow streets in response to uh, council office and, and community historic concerns with respect to speeding traffic, but also um, an increase in violence on that corridor uh, during uh, COVID. And so we're fortunate to have resources and are conducting a, a traffic calming study for longer term improvements. We're, and on the right of the slide are some examples of treatments that we're considering as a part of this work. But I also wanted to, in addition to sharing the curb extensions and diagonal diverters as some opportunities for traffic calming and lowering, lowering traffic um, volume, an important finding from this work has also been the opportunity for placemaking and, you know, and public art and with, with respect to ad addressing these multiple issues of, of safety. And so that's an opportunity for us to better think about how we can incorporate those uh, treatments as we're rolling out longer term improvements. Another finding from, from Slow Streets, our Essential Places program, which I think is particularly salient for this discussion, is um, while we've been historically prioritizing you know, improvements near schools, thinking about essential places as priorities for, uh, for traffic calming improvements and lowering speeds for, for the long term. So, you know, grocery stores, senior centers, uh, food distribution sites are other really important attractors for um, treatments for, for people that are more vulnerable to higher speeds and so can be a prioritization approach. And finally, um, I'd be remiss to not um, discuss, you know, given the pervasive issues with respect to speed, the importance of policy for, for local governments. And so we've been working um, with cities, you know, across California to better understand how we can advance tools that we currently don't have in Oakland, um, including speed management that would allow us to have more flexibility in lowering speed limits. Um, as well as the automated speed enforcement. So I just wanted to um, end there, but to say thank you so much for the opportunity to, to participate in today's panel. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Megan. That's absolutely fascinating. I um, really appreciate your perspective. Um, our last presentation will be from Rosanna Tudeau. Rosanna is the Senior Project Manager at 880 Cities, the Canadian nonprofit founded by former Bogota Parks Commissioner and Ciclovia inventor Gila Peñalosa. 880 Cities works internationally to make cities easier and safer for people of all ages from 880 to move through. Since 2015, Rosanna has led inclusive community engagement and planning processes in over 20 communities across North America and helped cities adopt new ways of piloting, measuring, and evaluating public realm interventions. Prior to 880 Cities, she worked for the Downtown Young Business Improvement Area, Toronto Community Housing, and at the MTA here in New York City. So Rosanna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Em, and thank you, Megan and Allison, for your wonderful presentations. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Oops, oh no, <laughs> you previewed it. <laughs> All right. Great. Hi everyone, my name is Rosanna and I'm a senior project manager with 880 Cities. And uh, when I think a little bit about my career arc and why I'm here with you talking today about designing for lower speeds and in particular, uh, Child-friendly streets. I go back to when I was six years old, 
and was completely obsessed with the movie Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Um, this movie really represented my ultimate childhood fantasy of having the freedom and independence to roam around a big city on my own. And I do believe that this uh, movie seeded in me this deep desire to live in New York. So I ended up doing my master's in urban planning there where one day at school, a man by the name of Enrique Penalosa came to speak. Uh, as mayor of Bogota in the 1990s, he spearheaded a really radical transformation of the city uh, by building the first connected bicycle network in all of the Americas, investing in a really innovative bus rapid transit system, and in general, supporting policies that reclaim streets for people. Um, and something he asked the audience that day that really resonated with me was, why do we live in daily fear of being hit by a car? Why is it that the most useful lesson that you can teach a young child is to watch out for cars? This is not normal and not something we should take for granted. Uh, instead, why can't children feel and be safe on the streets that they travel on every day? Uh, so this had a really big impact on me. And long story short, I landed a job here at 880 Cities, an organization founded by Gil Peñalosa, who just so happens to be Enrique's brother. Um, and 880 Cities is a nonprofit organization based in Toronto. We're committed to advancing social and health equity through the transformation of streets, parks, and public spaces. And we operate with a very simple philosophy. We believe that if everything we did in our cities was safe, accessible, and enjoyable for an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old, then it would be great for everyone and we would create cities for all. So even after all these years, uh, my childhood fantasy has not changed very much. Uh, after having my daughter two years ago, I'd say it's more relevant than ever. And it's still my dream to create the types of streets and neighborhoods on which my young daughter can freely and safely explore on her own. Which brings me to today's topic of designing for lower speeds. In particular, I'm gonna be talking about some community-led design and programming, programming interventions to create safer streets for children and subsequently for everyone else as well. So I'll mostly be talking about um, slow streets, school streets, and um, if we have time, open streets. Uh, so first up is uh, 880 Streets Pine Way, a project that we did in Toronto in summer of 2019 with the goal of reducing vehicular speeds on a suburban residential street in Toronto. So ever since uh, the Waze app got really popular, it's been redirecting a lot of drivers onto Pine Way Boulevard, which is home to many families and a local elementary school. Um, it's got these long winding curves that are just perfect for speeding vehicles. Uh, the city had to install three separate signs on this one street light just to get people to slow down, but to no avail. So we worked with the local community and counselor's office to pilot some traffic calming ideas on Pineway. Um, and I should say that we are not designers. We use SketchUp to create some really basic concept plans for the city to review based on NACTO's design guidelines for traffic calming. Uh, we downloaded CNC cut plywood furniture designs from Better Blocks Wiki Block website. It's a great resource for you all, by the way. And we use them as traffic calming measures. And we had this really fun and fantastic afternoon where we invited community members out to paint and put together, their, put together the furniture. The local counselor was there, kids, parents, their grandparents were all there to pitch in. Um, and it was really uh, important and fun to work with the community to physically build out the improvements that they were gonna see on their own street. And the interventions were really simple. We uh, created pinch points uh, using these colorful barriers barricades to narrow sections of the street where a lot of the speeding was happening. Uh, we use those same barriers to create chicanes, to create uh, make cars move in that serpentine motion. And we use these trapezoid benches to create ball belts to increase turning radii. And as I mentioned, the whole purpose of the project to, was to reduce vehicular speed and make it safer for people walking in the area. 
but how do we know that we were actually successful? Well, we used a really simple radar gun to capture the speed of vehicles traveling on Pine Way both before and during the pop-up and at different times of the day. Um, and not only were we able to achieve a reduction in the median speed uh, from 22 miles an hour to 15 miles an hour, um, there was a considerable effect on the instances of speeding on the street, whereas before the highest speed recorded was 42 miles an hour, during the pilot, it was only 30 miles an hour. And beyond lowering vehicular speeds and improving actual safety for residents, it was also really important for us to understand how the pilot affected perceived safety. So whereas before only one in four residents felt the street conditions were safe or very safe, that number increased to 89% after the pilot. And so I want to use this example because it was such a simple, quick, and super low cost way for the community to work with the city to collect evidence to build both um, community and institutional support for traffic calming in their neighborhood. Um, it also challenged the assumption that uh, many cities might make which is that suburban residents don't care about road safety, that they don't wanna have cars slowed down, but we know from this project that uh, that's not the case. Um, and so we've also seen that since COVID, um, there's been this acceleration of implementation of slow street programs as an emergency measure. Um, and because this had to happen all really quickly, it often resulted in this blanket, one size fits all approach. Um, and due to time and budget constraints, a lot of cities are just using whatever materials they have on hand, like traffic phones and barrels, which is totally understandable. But now that it's been a year into uh, this pandemic, there's this huge opportunity to now address early missteps, as um, Megan had alluded to, to refine slow streets and really work more closely with communities to ensure that slow streets reflect each community's unique needs and priorities. And so one uh, case study that I wanted to quickly highlight was the city of Montreal's approach. Um, they did do a mass um, implementation of slow streets where they did use traffic cones and barricades to create a slow streets network across the whole city. But in one particular borough, they invested more time and resources into the community engagement and design process um, and to pilot some more interim level solutions. And this was the result. So they, um, created some really cool traffic calming bulb outs using old malt bags donated by local breweries, which they filled with soil and greenery and these colorful stamps that they printed on the roadbed to further indicate the special designation of these slow streets. Um, and they used really beautiful and playful signage to reflect the intent and the name of the project. They called this uh, the family and active streets. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of like an example of kind of the next step that slow streets can take um, during the pandemic. Um, but in general, key design considerations that uh, we were uh, using were just making sure we were narrowing the street, making sure cars were uh, using a bigger turning radar, making sure the materials we were using were high visibility, and trying as much as we could to not make these improvements look like a construction zone, making sure there was friendly, informative signage, using aesthetically pleasing colors and incorporating greenery and softscape where we could. Um, the second project that I wanna talk about is called 880 Streets Mount View. It was uh, Toronto's first school streets uh, pilot. And in Toronto, we see that children are reoccurring victims of road violence. In a 12 year period, there were over 400 incidents of children who were walking, getting hit by people driving cars near Toronto schools. Um, studies have also shown that the number one reason parents in Toronto say they won't let their kids walk to school on their own is because they're worried about kids getting hit by cars. As a result, they drive their kids to school, creating the very unsafe conditions that leads them to not let their kids walk to school in the first place. So 80 uh, school streets, Mount View was really a test to see if creating a safer environment um, directly in front of the school would change those behaviors. Uh, this is what the drop off areas in front of the school on Mount View looks like on a typical day. Students had been hit in front of the school before and so there was already the support from parents and staff to do something about it. 
Um, and I should mention the school streets concept originated in England and the whole approach is to close down the street in front of the school for a short period of time around the start and end of the school day. And here's a picture of the section of the street uh, that we chose to uh, do the, that temporary closure. And so in order to do this, we work with the school community to create these colorful barricades, similar to the ones we used in, on Pine Way. Uh, volunteers, typically parents, uh, would pull these barricades out every morning at 8 a.m. and put them away at 9 a.m. And similarly, they would do it at the end of the school day, closing off the street at 3 p.m. and then opening it back up at 4 p.m. Um, but we've seen from other cities that you can really use anything as a barrier. Some people just put garbage bins with signs on them, and that works as well. And because this was the launch of School Streets in Toronto, we really wanted to go big. So we rolled out the red carpet and had our partner Eco Kids provide loose parts for kids to participate in free and unstructured play on the streets every morning and afternoon. And it, again, really low cost, simple materials, cardboard boxes, plywood, tires, whatever you can find. Um, and we closed the street to cars and opened it to people. And, um, the, the families and everyone who got to experience it really loved it. Um, the street, that, which used to be filled with cars and exhaust, became filled with sounds of children playing and laughing. And this worked even in not so great weather conditions. We did this pilot in a fall. It was really wet and rainy, and yet it still worked. But how do we know it worked? Um, we measured children's travel behavior before and during the pilot and found that the pilot increased the number of children walking by a small margin, 6%, but more interestingly, it increased the number of children um, biking to school by 27% and decreased the number of children being driven by 25%. And again, when we surveyed people, uh, whereas before only 23% of people felt that it was safe or very safe, that number, it was almost unanimous after the School Streets project, 98% uh, um, of folks agreed that it was safe or very safe with School Streets. Again, School Streets is a really simple, low cost um, intervention, uh, yet, uh, the impacts are significant. Key elements include making sure uh, the closure goes along the whole block leading up to the school, making the program consistent so people know to expect it, using high visibility barricades, and using clear friendly signage to communicate the closure to both people walking and driving, and to understand that road safety doesn't have to be boring. It could be fun and playful as well. Um, Great. I don't want to use up too much time, so I won't talk too much about open streets. I'll just mention that these are programs that close the street to cars and open them up to people to walk, run, play, scoot, and experience their city in a whole new way. Um, originated in Bogota. Um, and there are just a few key ingredients to keep in mind. Um, for creating a successful open streets program. Uh, you should use an iconic street as your spine that will draw people in. Um, and then from there, you should branch out and connect to as many uh, local neighborhoods as possible. Um, going long makes a big difference. So the route should be at least six miles to connect diverse neighborhoods and socioeconomic groups and ensuring that the timing of your program is at least four hours in length and that it is indeed a program that occurs regularly in order to incur those health benefits. Um, but I will uh, talk too much about it because we have a website that we develop with street plans called openstreetsproject.org where you can find everything you need to know to create your own open streets program uh, starting from how to build a team to all like the tiny or the detailed logistics of hosting one um, and that's it for me thank you everyone thank you so much rosanna that's fantastic um, I would love to get started on our discussion by asking the panelists to dive a little bit more into the root of the problem. Um, it seems like every urban area, um, big or small, even rural areas are being hit hard by traffic violence. Um, so what do all of these places have in co common? Is it a culture of driving? Is it the cars themselves? Why is everyone seemingly dealing with the same issue right now?
Um, I can start with um, just discussing, I think Megan touched lightly on this, but I think that we're seeing an increase in this in the past year um, because of the reduction of traffic in some ways. I do think there's a whole culture of cars, <laughs> so another thing to unpackage. Um, but I think we're seeing more um, safety issues because people are traveling faster because there's less resistance um, in the streets, you know, whereas there might have been more gridlocked cities before. You have the ability with less resistance, whether that's less parking demand or um, less traffic on the streets to go very fast at, at unsafe speeds, which is leading, of course, to more um, injurious crashes. I can um, add, add to, to that response with respect to, you know, I think uh, historically traffic deaths have really been normal, you know, normalized as an inevitable outcome of our, of our transportation system. So, you know, in addition to the um, like terrible increase that we've seen over the past year, just historically, um, there hasn't been as much, you know, attention to, to these fatalities. It's something that's preventable. Um, and so, you know, in the within the last decade, it's been really heartening, you know, to see the, the impacts of um, coalitions and, you know, advocacy around the country, increasing awareness of traffic deaths is something that's preventable. Um, and not something that is depend, you know, dependent on individual choices, but is inherently part of how we've designed our systems um, for the movement of vehicles and speed over over the safety and the health health of our communities. And so, um, there's you know, in your there's so many factors, um, you know, from from system design to vehicle design um, to policy, um, you know. From a safe systems perspective, talking about you know vehicles, um, people, education, engagement, and you know and our and roadways is all opportunities to make this change. I'll stop there. Yeah, that is a totally big question, but I guess what I'll focus on is um, I think uh, we need to rethink how we met measure success in cities when it comes to designing our streets. And so many cities that we've worked with, including in Toronto, a lot of the times when you're trying to implement any changes to the roads, um, something you come up against is the fact that, oh, well then uh, this has like a, this will cause a two minute delay in car traffic. And that's not being, um, what, what are we considering here when we use that as kind of like, um, you know, the measure of whether or not something should get approved. So is it, uh, are we trying to move as many cars as possible? Or are we trying to move people? Are we trying to prioritize the enjoyment of people when they are on the streets? So just kind of rethinking, um, you know, what are our uh, goals and priorities um, and how do we measure success on our streets? Particularly with this past year's pandemic, have you seen perspectives begin to change and especially with the importance of community engagement? And I know that you all have done a lot of work with community engagement. Um, have you seen those conversations be different when you go to communities? I think the biggest shift from what um, we've seen and this is maybe across the continent as well as like this shift to the hyper local and how that is that much more important right now as you know obviously there's uh, still people who need to travel to get to work but there is this greater emphasis on like what's directly in your own neighborhood and how can we make that experience of traveling around your own neighborhood as safe and enjoyable as possible? And that's why we're seeing kind of the rise of the um, in support for slow streets programs and things like that. So I think the big shift is now kind of not always focusing on like these networks that, um, you know, go from the periphery to the downtown, but looking at really hyper local neighborhood networks and increasing um, the enjoyable how enjoyable and accessible those are. I'll, I'll agree with Rosanna um, with respect to, um, you know, my my tenure in Oakland has been only only during the pandemic, so I can't speak to how it changes, but just the critical role, of, you know, of community engagement and, and adapting our community engagement, you know, given that, you know, 
in the traditional kind of in-person in approaches have have really changed. But also, I do think people are a lot more aware, uh, you know, of transportation conditions, you know, in in their front in their front yard, and we have a lot more people, of, you know, observing observing their streets, and you know, reaching out to the city with with respect to those issues. But you know, I think the the larger the larger challenges and also in a lot of the areas where we have the most acute issues um, and injuries, we have the biggest challenges, you know, with respect for community engagement. So I think we, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I would love to hear from Rosanna and Allison. In your work with cities around the continent, can you give some examples of how you've seen slow streets interventions successfully adapt to the local context in infrastructure and approach um, versus how much how much do you need to adapt? How much is just universal and you can kind of apply the simple geometries from city to city? Um. I can start, I guess, with, um, I do feel like as I work across the country, there are definitely more compromises um, presented and trying to define what a win is for safety success, though it might be more incremental, depends on the context. But I would say that I see that more and more cities, no matter where they are in the country, are more open to the smaller geometry um, than you'd probably be expected. And I think some of that's thanks to NACDO doing you know, member cities and trainings, and there just being more education floating around and more interest and awareness in the tie between, you know, there are factors in the way that a street is set up, setting it, the way it's set up, contributing to increased speeding and increased incidence of crashes. Um, but yeah, it definitely depends. I feel like there's, there's <laughs> very unique compromises that come up, whether that's you know, a certain, in a certain context, you know, they might be doing a 15 foot lane and getting down to 11 or 12 is just amazing, even though they could go lower. <laughs> I'd, yeah, I'd say a lot of the concepts are quite tried, tested and true at this point, but how they get implemented needs to reflect the local context in which you're working. Um, a lot of communities, um, have a lot of like historical trauma when it comes to transportation infrastructure projects. And so um, I think it all comes down to community engagement and meeting people where they are. Um, I mean that both literally and figuratively, I think something we do in a lot of the work, uh, our engagement work is, um, you know, even if we're doing a transportation project, depending on the community you're working with, you can't kind of start off by talking about the bike lane, you know, even if that's what you got maybe funding to explore, it has to be reflect some of the priorities uh, that people are dealing with on a day to day. And um, so, yeah, it's really uh, some of the concepts of creating safe streets. Again, we all kind of know what works, but how it gets implemented. And I think the Oakland example is a really great example of this. Um, needs to reflect local context. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about speed limits and the role that speed limits play. Um, here in New York City, um, Transportation Alternatives and our sister organization, Families for Safe Streets, are working with State Senator Brad Hoylman, who will actually be presenting at this conference, I think, tomorrow, um, to pass legislation permitting New York City to lower speed limits below 25 miles per hour. Um, and that bill is going will be named Sammy's Law in honor of um, Sammy Cohen Eckstein, who was killed at age of 12 in Brooklyn. Um, would anyone be able to speak a little bit um, as to the role speed limits should play in the efforts to slow drivers? Is that, should that work in tandem with designs? Is it a replacement? What does, what role does that have? Megan, I was wondering if you want to speak to that one. <laughs> I was going to, I was about to unmute, but I wasn't sure if you were about to, I didn't want to <laughs> step on you. No, this um, is for you. <laughs> no, so, I mean, we've been, you know, I, I participated in our state zero traffic fatalities task force, and that was um, a task force that was looking at, um, you know, what are more, 
effective measures where there's opportunity for legislative change to, to save lives and definitely speed management and flexibility of local jurisdictions in lowering speed limits was one of the key findings um, from, that, um, from that work. So as opposed to relying solely on the 85th percentile um, to set speed limits, which has been documented to actually, you know, over time lead to increases in speeds. And of course, you know, we're, we're here talking about the lethality of increasing speeds. Um, looking at um, how local jurisdictions can set, set speed limits more consistent with safety. So, you know, examples could be having lower some flexibility in speed limit setting on high injury networks or near um, locations where more more vulnerable travelers are. And I know there's been really recent encouraging research, I believe, out of Portland, um, you know, with respect to implementation of signage only, you know, having benefits for for lowering speeds. I think when it comes to speeds, you know, we need all the tools we can, you know, in a, in our toolkit, and this is a, a really important tool with respect to imp implementing um, signage for more jurisdictions to be able to have. Yeah, and just adding to that, I, I do see them going together as part of the toolkit. Uh, there's posting the sign and doing the research and the analysis for that, but there's still a design speed of what's possible on the streets. And so I think that they should definitely go hand in hand from my perspective. Okay, we have a few audience questions to get through quite a few. Um, a question for Allison from Denise Nickel. What municipal departments um, have cooperated to in say Somerville Reese, snow plowing, fire and police safety, mobility, et cetera? Has there been much cooperation there? Yeah, I think Somerville is a pretty cooperative city. I think um, there's a couple other people that also asked about fire truck access and deliveries and larger trucks. And so I might try to speak to all of those in swoop, but, but um, Somerville, the safe streets pilot that they've been doing, um, they actually remove some of the bollards during the, the winter. So there is like a seasonal factor. They still have the signage posted and encouraged, um, but there is a little bit of a compromise given the climate um, factors and the maintenance factors. Um, but definitely working with fire departments, it can sometimes be a challenge. I don't think that's uh, unique to the cities that brought that up in some of their comments. Um, but I definitely feel like it's that's a negotiation that needs to happen in terms of what is a win-win between the overall picture of safety on the streets and what they're trying to achieve. And so, when we enter those um, conversations, we, you know, we try to understand as much as possible where they're coming from and trying to educate and expand the conversation to potentially reforming the code and looking at case studies from other cities, um, looking at, you know, do you need this particular vehicle in all contexts, look at cities that are exploring other types of vehicles and what the price tags are for those, but it's definitely still a really difficult um, conversation um, and roll, involves rolling the sleeves up <laughs> with negotiations. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that too. I hadn't raised my hand yet, but I, I, I sort of thought I was going to try. Um, but I, I just want to add, like with respect to fire department, you know, fire departments, we, I'm, we're really fortunate in Oakland to have a very like positive ongoing working relationship with our fire department. But I, I know like these are really common challenges with respect to design. Um, and I would just encourage, you know, people working in DOTs to really look for interdepartmental, par you know, partnerships with with fire and other agencies, and you know, on an ongoing basis. So here we work with fire on public safety power shutoffs, a wildfire response, and a host of other emergency issues. So creating, you know, those relationships. So when you're having, you know, difficult discussions about turning radii or um, speed bumps, you know, there's, there's kind of that, that those ongoing partnerships could be helpful. I was thinking of some of the examples that Rosanna showed, but the tactical pilots are really helpful with this too. We've done this in a couple of projects where you put it on the street and maybe it's the cheapest intervention you do, but having people test the driving infrastructure, you know, there's might be a, a fear that the particular truck won't make it around the geometry of whatever it is you're trying to intervene in the street. 
um, but we've had success in like having them, you know, test it. We'll see, you know, where does the wheel path go in real life out in the streets to see, you know, test the effectiveness and get their buy-in that way. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question about um, tactical urbanism measures. Maybe Rosanna, you'd be able to answer this one. How do you deal with opposition when you're implementing those? Um, and then how do you then go and make them permanent? Uh, yeah, so I would say that um, tactical urbanism is just one type of, it's not just like, it's a big engagement tool that we use. So we use it as an opportunity to engage and educate people. And I think something with a lot of tactical urbanism projects that kind of, um, you know, they're usually short term and that normally appeases people knowing that, okay, these aren't gonna be in here forever as they look as the way that they're set up right now. Um, but it, provides us enough time to collect evidence to see if it works or not. Um, so usually, yeah, the benefit of tactical urbanism projects is that for people who are skeptical, they know that it's not there forever. But in terms of making um, more long lasting changes, um, I say, yeah, the data will tell the story of um, how the a tactical urbanism project can um, have a longer lifespan. So I think in the context of working in Toronto, um, there is like a very high threshold for data that's required <laughs> whenever you want to do something new on streets. And so that's just the tactic that we've used is to collect as much data as possible to demonstrate what worked, what didn't, be really open and transparent about what didn't work. I think that's really helpful for communities and the city as well. Um, but yeah, I think data, data, data. Kind of on a similar note, Rosanna and Megan, I would love to hear your experience. How do you balance the need for large scale change, you know, when they're speeding on a, a whole street network, a whole city, um, and then balance that with the need for these intense community engagement processes and reflection and high quality materials. That's a great question. Um, I think like having, uh, you know, just acknowledging the, the limited resources we have, I think it gets back to, you know, the prioritization question. So, you know, where are we having with respect to short, you know, short term, more intensive engagement, more, you know, more intensive treatments, you know, where, where is the greatest need, you know, like based on our equity factors, based on our, on our, on crash factors, based on, um, you know, locations where, where more vulnerable populations are traveling. Um, and then, but with respect to like the, it's really critical to have the long view, both re with respect to, um, policy, you know, changes like, you know, changes in speed limit setting that could have like citywide impacts or um, just ongoing work with community partners, elected, elected officials, you know, all stakeholders with respect to changing that culture, you know, around pri prioritizing safety and increasing, increasing demand um, for, for those types of, of treatments. So, um, you know, and then looking at tools, uh, like for example, automated speed enforcement, where there's obvious, there's critical equity issues to be addressed, you know, in any implementation, but also where it's a, it's a tool that has the potential impact for, ma for making major changes, you know, along corridors, sorry, but um, along corridors and also, um, you know, changing patterns for people across the city. Yeah, I guess the work that we do is really uh, community based, um, so usually very focused. And so I guess I can only speak to our own experience working on that. But even going back to the school streets project that I was talking about, I think what we find um, as people who work in transportation, that it is really kind of like daunting and you can get bogged down with this idea of creating like this like citywide change to make safer streets. But school streets uh, just demonstrated that you could have um, immediate impact by just focusing on like the 300 feet in front of the school. 
So there's like really like low hanging fruit, quick wins that you can have to balance with kind of like the longer term strategies and systemic change that you're trying to um, achieve. And I think the quick wins are super important for people working as ed transportation advocates or as planners, because otherwise, like who has the will to go on <laughs> if otherwise. Prove that it works, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Allison, it looks like you saw a question from Brian Phillips um, who's asked, who is interested in balancing good, goods movement, which often needs longer radii and wider lanes with the desire to slow down streets to improve safety. So he asks, what design tactics do you use in those contexts? Yeah, one, um tool that I don't think I had a picture of in my slides is a mountable um, truck apron. So that's like a skirt that basically goes around the side of the, um, the corner where a, a particular wheel of a larger vehicle that needs to mount the turn um, could make such a turn, um, but still it effectively slows the speeds going around the corner. Um, but I, I'm seeing that a lot of cities are piloting different ways of intercepting deliveries. You know, people are getting on average of a, a delivery a day at many homes these, these days. And um, given that there's a lot of cities that are piloting a zone of you know, where there might be an intercept of having either a smaller vehicle or e-cargo bikes or other things like that that can mitigate the number of larger vehicles that are coming right into the core of a city because of those um, present safety issues. But if they, if they are remaining, I think there's a couple of you know, medium design tactics like the truck aprons or other things like that um, that could be deployed instead, but it'd be great to also see cities adapting the policy as well in terms of what is the maximum vehicle, size vehicle that might be able to come into a certain zone of the area where there's more walking and biking activity. Um, Rosanna, we got a question about the the school clo or street closure um, and asking whether there was increased congestion on streets around the schools um, and whether or not there was, how did you counter pushback from people who anticipated there being increased congestion? Um, so there was no increased congestion in the streets around the school. And I think that was mostly due in part to the decrease in number of people driving their kids to school, um, which we were able to achieve. And in terms of yeah, um, counteracting people's fears about there being increased congestion beyond uh, in the surrounding areas. We, we also use case studies from other jurisdictions that have shown that school streets have been able to um, mitigate that. Like um, it hasn't caused significant traffic delays precisely because you, the goal is to reduce the number of people driving their kids to school. That's the main cause of the traffic. So again, data, data, data. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we just have a couple minutes left here. So maybe we can just go around and um, everyone can give a quick 30 second or minute answer um, about what would a safe and slow street outside of your front door mean to you, to your family, to your neighbors? Um, what, what is your dream for what that street could be? I think I alluded to it when I introduced myself, but um, my dream is for when my daughter, like when she turns six, to walk to school by herself. School is two blocks away and I don't wanna have to worry about her safety. I don't wanna have to worry about cars. I wanna uh, feel comfort in knowing that she's just like safely exploring the sidewalks on her way to and from school and that I don't have to you know, spend my day carting her around. <laughs> Um, I live on what I consider an ideal street that has a yield street condition, um, pretty narrow curb to curb. I find that pretty ideal. I will say my street is pretty heavily residential, um, but you know, I think my ideal for a street is one where I don't have to pay as much cognizant and cautious attention looking both ways as I cross the street um, and that there won't be you know, cars speeding on it and it doesn't take me more than like 10 seconds to get from one sidewalk to the other. And I can think about crossing at any point along the block and not just at the intersection where more crashes might be likely to occur. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, thinking about the safe and slow street for me, is just like, 
the opportunity for both physical and mental health when you walk out your front door. I mean, now, um, you know, I, I have two children and when they walk out the front door, my, you know, my first thought is always just like, how do I get down the steps before they get, you know, onto the sidewalk and, and close to the street in case someone, is, you know, is, is speeding by. And so I think that that just really speaks to like the incredible amount of work, you know, work we have to do, you know, to, and this is, I, I think it's a condition outside of most everyone's uh, front door or driveway, um, you know, depending on, on where you live. So um, I think that's a really powerful question to, you know, to help ground us in um, where we are and, and the work we all have to do together. So thank you for, for having this conversation. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, Megan, Allison, and Rosanna. This has been fantastic. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us to discuss these crucial issues. Um, we hope that this conversation has helped inspire and inform your own perspective or your work around designing safer streets. And we hope you'll join us again for our next session at 2.30 in just 30 minutes or 29 minutes now to hear about how to make sure that these streets are accessible for all users. And if you wanna hear more about how to bring slowed streets to your community, please join us tomorrow at noon for our Advocating for Lower Streets panel. Thank you so much. And Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye everyone, thank you.